Welcome to another edition of Focus on Alternatives, brought to you by ADISA, the Alternative and Direct Investment Securities Association. For more content like this, please visit adisa.org and check out the resource library. My name is Greg Maas. I'm your host today. This is a podcast-only edition of Focus on Alts, and I have David Levitt. He's partner at Elm Tree Funds. Um, he's here today, and we're going to be talking industrial real estate, um, some nuances of it, some pros, some cons of it. Um, David, thank you for your time. Thanks, Greg. I really appreciate you having me and your time as well. So... Industrial real estate, we're going we're gonna to go down a path here, but let's start broad. Can you just walk us through what is real, uh, industrial real estate? What are the different types of industrial real estate? No problem. I, I think from the perspective of the main four food groups of real estate, you have lodging, multifamily, industrial, and office. So when you look at industrial broadly, it kind of is a category unto itself that's also evolved over the last 30 years. I think if you took a look at any airport in, say, 1990, you would see what people typically thought of as an industrial building, which is kind of a large shed by the airport with a bunch of shelving and racks in it and other things like that. You also had a combination of light manufacturing in certain cases or heavy manufacturing, which would be one of those sheds with a lot of equipment in it, a lot of machinery focused on a different industry or something along those lines. But as we've evolved and gone forward with that, and the user's needs have become more sophisticated, you now see much more of a specialization within the category. You now have data centers, which are, fall broadly within the industrial category. You have cold storage, which in and of itself has some subcategories, depending on what type of cold storage it is. You still have light manufacturing, and then you have a range of other specialized types of assets that would be broadly categorized as industrial. So you walk through those four main food groups. I mean, office used to be you know, the darling of real estate. Um, multifamily has been actually huge over the last decade, but what's been really gaining ground uh, is industrial real estate. So what are some of the driving forces behind all that growth? Well, I think one thing is we've seen the internet generation grow up. So you now have now almost two generations of consumers that have grown up accustomed to ordering things on their phone, ordering things through their computer, getting things delivered to their home. So while you still have the traditional brick and mortar, you also have this extreme growth of consumers in their 20s and 30s who are very accustomed to ordering everything from groceries to TVs to anything you can imagine online. And obviously, there's very large e-commerce retailers. I think that's one the central driving force that's led to this expansion, not just from Amazon or Walmart, but all across the retail spectrum. If you go to your local Home Depot or you stop at any type of strip mall, you'll see the parking spaces that are marked for pickup or something like that. You walk into a store and you see a shelf on the right that says for pickup. So it's also the merger and blend of that last mile delivery of people who are just used to ordering things online without a tangible asset. I think at the same time as well, you initially saw with data centers, the growth of the internet obviously in the 90s, which had a demand for capacity. And now you're seeing kind of another explosion of data centers that's being driven by quantum computing and artificial intelligence needs uh, and those kind of needs as well. Cold storage has also developed as an asset class unto itself, which has been driven by online grocery ordering and the expectation that people, again, can order things, uh, food, whatever else that gets to their home in an hour or less or two hours or less. So those are really the broad categories that are driving it. I think there's a larger secular trend as well to what we call reshoring, which is post-COVID bringing back certain parts of the supply chain within the continental United States, both for security of the supply chain and dependability. I think a lot of lessons have been learned with different kinds of uh, global events that has led more U.S. retailers and manufacturers to look to bringing things back to the United States. I think another kind of category of it that's been very interesting is that for the first time in 20 years, Mexico outpaced China in terms of U.S. exports last year. So you're also seeing along the southern border, Texas, Arizona, states such as that, a real outgrowth of logistics facilities that are intended to accommodate those imports that are now coming from Mexico. Wow, lots of positive drivers there, and I don't see many of those trends changing anytime soon. So, I mean, there's a lot of industrial buildings that are being built. Let's throw out a couple of common terms that we hear and let you unpack them. So, a build-to-suit industrial building, what is that? Well, that's a specific category of what we call a net lease asset, which not to throw out another term, but we can get into it. But a build-to-suit asset is, the way to think about it very simply is, 
you have a tenant that comes to a developer or an investor such as ourselves and says, I want a specific building intended to accommodate the use of that tenant. So if you are, let's say, a auto battery manufacturer and you're working with EV cars, there are certain things that you need within your facility to otherwise accommodate your operations, whether it's the slab, which is the foundation of the building, having to accommodate certain loads or weights, whether it is the number of dock doors, which is what you see in these facilities when you drive by, you fly over them, where the big rigs pull up. There are very specific needs and requirements that tenants may have to do that. So when you have a built-to-suit asset, that's exactly what it is. Imagine a custom asset that is built specific to the needs of a tenant. Okay, and then, you know, that tenant has it built and then owns it, or do they sometimes lease it? Well, traditionally, built-to-suit is used in the context of triple net lease, and that's where it's been. So it's a combination of, one, funding the build-out and development of the asset itself in combination with a long-term net lease to that tenant. So in the case of a lot of the e-commerce build-outs of the last 10 years, for a variety of reasons, a tenant may say, I want this specific type of asset built to my needs. And in order for you, the landlord or owner, to be willing to do that, I'm willing to make a commitment of 15 to 20 years of leasing the asset. Makes sense. How do you balance when somebody's doing a build a suit on, it's great that I have this you know, long-term lease of 10, 15, 20 years, but you know, they may move out at the end of that period. I don't want to over-customize the building, right? So how do you balance that in the development? Or is that even possible? Well, I think the first thing you do is you do a lot of analysis around the mission criticality of the asset itself and the operations. So these assets are not being built for 10 or 20 years. They're generational assets. And there are a lot of lessons to be learned in the evolution of the asset class itself. I think if you look back, as I alluded to earlier, to the assets of the 1970s and 80s, I don't think it was possible to foretell that somebody would need a requirement to be able to put, say, a massive set of computer servers across the foundation of a particular asset. So today, these assets are being built for adaptability uh, in terms of both the racking, storage, and use of the assets. So from that, I think the first step is to say this asset is truly mission critical to the future of that. You talk to the tenants, you look at their business chain, you talk to various people at the company, at the tenants. It's a very open, collaborative process. I think the other way that you can do it is you can make these assets with construction today somewhat modular. So let's assume that you're dividing the asset into three different types of spaces to accommodate the tenant's needs. When you put in those dividing walls, you can do so and develop it in a way that if you ever had to shift the use, if that tenant vacated or did something else, those walls can be easily removed to accommodate a different type of use. Got it. So the other side of build a suit, I guess, is just a spec building that somebody else has built right. and, the, and the tenant hopes that it meets their needs. Um, can you, you know, what, what are some of the unique features of an industrial build a suit that may be better than perhaps just a spec build? From the outset of speculative building, it could be suited out or fit out, which is what we call the latter stages of a build out as well to accommodate needs. But going back to that first stage, when we talked about things that are called loads, let's say, which is a type of measurement as to, if you think about the foundation of a home, it's the same thing with the storage facility itself. When you lay the concrete that otherwise is intended to support what's put on there, Within that facility, it has to be poured to a certain thickness or requirement to accommodate what's going to go there. With a speculative building, you don't get the ability to set those specifications at the outset. Let's assume you know at the outset that you have a particular type of tractor trailer that you're going to otherwise use in your operations or facilities. So when you're putting in 50 to 60 of these dock doors, which is what the tractor trailers pull up to, you have the ability to build the width, height, the dimensions of those specifically to that tenant's operations or what they think they're going to be in five years. Let's assume they may use electric tractor trailers, uh, something like that. So there is a degree of specificity that you can otherwise do in customization that you may not have available to you in a speculative industrial building. The other component of it that's very significant is that you're able to set the rents on that building at the outset of development. So the lease that you enter into with a tenant is entered into before the ground is broken for that facility. So you know the rents as a tenant and as an owner at the outset of the particular project. So you have certainty from a financial accounting, treasury, and other standpoint as a tenant as to what you're going to pay over that period of time. A speculative building, on the other hand, is set by a variety of factors, absorption, different factors such as that. So there could be a degree of uncertainty if you think you're going to take that building in six months for planning purposes. Thank you for that compare and contrast. That was very helpful. What are some of the key structural considerations of a build-a-suit investment? 
Well, I think a lot of it relates to some of the things that we touched upon earlier, which is one, really considering the players that are involved. That's not just the tenant in which you're entering into a lease, but it's also your developer partner and ensuring that that developer partner has the appropriate experience in the market and with the tenant to build that build to suit facility. Uh, it's the different contractors working with the tenants contractors to make sure that you meet the specifications that the tenant has set forth and also ensuring that within the legal documentation surrounding the particular build to suit asset there's a lot of moving parts that everybody's economic and commercial interests are met at the same time protecting the investors interest. Understood. You know, the financial advisors out there, their clients, why should they consider industrial assets as an investment? I think industrial assets have proven, particularly through this cycle, to be very durable. I think that in comparable classes of real estate, it's been shown that really the valuation hits and the attendant financing and other types of obstacles that certain other asset classes may have encountered have not been encountered in the industrial kind of area. You've seen a continuing demand across the spectrum from tenants and developers otherwise for these assets. I think specific to an industrial built to suit asset is that you're getting almost the equivalent of a fixed income product if you think about it. So if you look at a comparable yield basis to say what the tenants corporate bonds are trading at and you look at a 15 to 20 year lease that's generating a yield higher than that, that can be very attractive on a risk return basis for investors. And you have that lease which is really ironclad and is going to run through. So if the tenant vacates, just to be clear, they typically have to still pay rent. So for that 15 to 20 year period. Makes a lot of sense. Bond alternative, inflation hedges. Exactly. In those leases, you can do rent bumps um, that give that added income over time. I think as an inflation hedge, which is a great point that you raise, in a triple net lease, operating expenses are borne by the tenant. So if you look at the different facets of maintaining a facility as well, and you look at the cost of labor and materials in an inflationary environment, you're also gaining that hedge because those expenses are being shifted to the tenant who is taking on that. And to your other very good point, the leases often contain set rental escalators on an annual basis, 2 or 3%. So you also have that built-in hedge as well. Great. Well, clearly, industrial has been a core food group, and it looks like it's going to be a strong Uh, investment performer for years to come. So, David, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Well, thank you, Greg, for having me. I very appreciate it. And thank you to Adisa as well. And thank you for listening to another edition of Focus on Alternatives. Again, for more information like this, please visit adisa.org. Thank you.